Thank you, Carl Sarr. Thank you, Father. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Media Watch. Every week we try and get together and cover the news of the week. I'm your host, Dr. Savvy, and with me we've got some great guests. This time around we've got Shim Shia Singh from the Sikh Research Institute. Thank you, Carl Sarr. Thank you, Father. We've also got Simajit Kaur, a world-famous author. She's going to blush when I say that, and she is, though, and I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. Simajit Kaur. Simajit Kaur is actually from Durban Punjab Widows, uh, a charity that does a hell of a lot of work over in uh, India to support the victims of 1984. Uh, she's also a very famous author. I really uh, love the book that she wrote called Saffron Salvation. And she wrote another book after that that somebody got off me and I never got back and I was halfway through it. Uh, and I hope she'll give me a copy signed, uh, but I'll have to convince her about that. Uh, and Seat Research Institute have done lots and lots of work over in the US and Canada and worldwide in terms of consistency. Now let's talk about the program that we have every week for you. Uh, we have the program split into four parts. The first part is to talk about uh, a couple of news headlines that are hitting. Now this is not just Seat News, this is world news. The second part is to cover off the headlines in general, and we cover them off and talk a little bit about them. And then we follow that on with Seat News specifically around the world. And finally we look at this week in history, and that's very useful for everyone to learn more about the heritage that we have as the Sikh community, and also as a kind of route and bridge for interfaith for other people to know more about who we are. So let's continue with the show. Welcome. And I wanted to start off with a story that we were talking about last week, uh, still hitting the headlines, uh, and still very sad and grave, uh, this situation with regards to Iraq. Now, my understanding is, from latest news reports that are coming in, is that there's something like um, 300 military advisors, because, you know, last week we were covering off what would be Obama's actual options. What could he do? Can he not get around the table or left to send in military people? Well, they're sending in advisors. And also, um, the situation had got so bad, I think the militants are actually at the airport. Also, they've taken um, a kind of a, a housing over in the refinery, and, uh, which, is, which is terrible because, you know, once you've got the biggest refinery, that's going to have a ripple effect across the world in terms of oil prices. I, I still can't get over why, you know, one country's oil situation can kind of hit other ones. Um, so it's pretty weird. What, what do you think, Shimshir, about this situation? Do you still think that military uh, advice is one way of going forward and sorting it out? I think it's, uh, Obama's actions are quite predictable in terms of um, America's uh, response to situations like this. Um, and I think we were talking about it last week, it's just going to cause further destabilization in the area um, and uh, lead to more fighting. Um, it's inevitable. I think the next step after this is probably going to send in airstrikes and drones to drop bombs. So I think it's going to lead, further lead to um, the power vacuum that's there. It's going to add more fuel to it. Yeah, so it's not... What, what do you think, Samaj? Do you think this is like... I mean, it, it seems to be the first thing that's on the table is we'll send in a bunch of military because the situation just goes out of control. Well, um, with the Iraq situation, it's become really complex. Um, it suited the Western powers to get militarily involved at one point years ago. Um, now they really do face a very physical threat um, from uh, the Sunni factions that are going in through ISIS. Um, however, you know, um, we've seen civil war in the Punjab, um, and I don't think any Sikh would ever advocate further violence in a region where civilians are going to be under attack. If drones are used, there will be no way in which they can even um, see where ISIS are. If ISIS end up in Baghdad, which at the moment they won't because uh, they are in a they're minority of Sunnis, yeah. but um, then you are looking at all-out war, and everything we've learned about war is that it doesn't work, and the loss of life, as in June 1984, the loss of life every day, every hour, is just too much. Mm. What's interesting is that they, they seem to be uh, budding up to Iran. Uh, you know, that, I thought that was quite interesting in the news as well, wasn't it? The fact that you know, there were certain sanctions are being dropped and certain mm. discussions are taking place. It's a shame they didn't see earlier on that the sort of sanctions that they put against Iran actually destroyed civilian life in Iran as well. Mm. And that um, uh, people were really suffering on a day-to-day -day basis just because of their foreign policy. I, I would say that... But I can't could, really comment on America's foreign, foreign policy. I think people are quite savvy to it. But let's go back in time a little bit, way back in time, uh, where you actually look at uh, apartheid over in South Africa. There were sanctions applied there to 
that country, and lots of people actually suffered. So, you know, I think it depends on a on a case by case basis. But, um, you know, I mean, it, war hurts people regardless, mm. doesn't it? Um, another headline that came through was uh, I believe that the UN issued a report saying that the uh, population of refugees in the world has exceeded 50 million, and that's a figure from 2013. Um, and they talk about, and I was really shocked. I mean, I don't know if you know anything about this. It's an organ, um, part of an organization, uh, I think they're called the, uh, the Curran uh, Minority over in Burma. They, they kind of are on the border between Thailand and Burma. Some of them have been living there for 20 years. And when I say some, I mean 120,000 people have been living in a refugee camp there for, uh, for 20 years. I mean, again, another side effect of war uh, is the refugee situation. Uh, but the thing is, though, do you not think that some of these things that go on for such a long time, they don't end up being newsworthy? No one talks about them, uh, and therefore they just get forgotten. Yeah, totally. I mean, this type of conflict always creates so much human displacement and refugees, and, and unfortunately it's not something that's picked up in the Western media because it's not what people, um, I assume the media thinks it's not what people want to read about. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of this uh, in Iraq as well in the coming years. Um, so it's a, a very unfortunate situation, but... I, um, unfortunately, it's not newsworthy enough. Mm. I wonder what I think is it, right, because um, unfortunately, the media and generally people um, on a day-to-day -day basis, they are more interested in EastEnders or the World Cup than they are in human displacement, which is an absolute misery. Um, our parents were displaced, a lot of our parents, in 1947. So we're actually children of refugees. A lot of Sikhs around the world are. Absolutely. And they've seen what, what the impact of that is. And, and it actually means that, you know, it takes another generation a great deal of time to catch up. It, with respect to the Karen, they have had a resistance movement similar to the Khalistan movement um, in the 1980s and 90s. Um, they've hidden in the jungles. They want self-determination. Um, they, however, um, just like uh, people in other parts of Algeria, Sy um, Syria, they've all faced this. And you do end up with these long-term refugee camps, which end up becoming people's lives, living, living in a tent um, for 30, 40 years. Um, but um, what the Sikhs, I think, should understand is that um, although uh, we went through a lot of suffering in the Civil War in the 80s and 90s, um, we were very fortunate that we didn't ha end up with living in tents. I don't think you're living in a tent right now. I'm not living in a tent. And a lot of the people of the Punjab aren't. So we're not in those sort of conditions. However, um, as we'll touch on later, there is a lot of people whose lives were displaced uh, in the last 30 years by the Indian state's actions. Um, and they're still suffering. Absolutely. And uh, it's interesting, I mean, while you were uh, talking about people being displaced, I was thinking that sometimes people are born into those camps, you know. Um, and in a, in a way, when you look at a, uh, a place, uh, you remember that film, uh, Slumdog Millionaire, when you look at the slums, mm. and people are, are actually sadly born in those slums, and that's what they know, that's their way of life. And, and that's a very sad situation that they don't have opportunities to come out of that yet they'll be looking up and thinking, hey, there's a skyscraper. Mm. I'm living at the bottom of the skyscraper. Yeah. You but know? you're reminding me, really, of this um, story I was reading about um, refugees um, who've been ousted out of Algeria, and they're literally living in the desert. They've spent um, two generations, but they're ferociously proud of what they stand for, their flag, their coins, and the fact that they can be shot down at any minute by border control mm. is another matter. But, um, and in that way, I feel that the Sikhs, although they have memorialized on an anniversary basis what happened in the Punjab in 1984, they don't seem to have that sort of level of pride on a daily basis. Mm. And that is actually quite worrying. So in a way, they sort of settle down to normal life. Um, whereas these people in tents still uh, very much believe in self-determination. Yeah. And that, that is but what they that, look for, even on, if they don't have food on the table. But we are going to touch on the people that, that uh, effectively is a ripple effect, mm -hmm. those that have suffered or uh, have lost their husbands or their, you know, their wives, or you know, even if you look at the November situation in Delhi, or if you look at the Punjab situation in uh, post-June 84, they are still living with the, those losses today. Um, and then since then they may have had kids and they may be suffering. Mm. So let, let's move on to the next part of the program where we talk about news in general.
Uh, again, talking about all the negative stuff, you know, we've, we've just been talking about uh, refugees. Another negative aspect we find, uh, we find that the Guardian reported the fact that uh, slavery, modern day slavery, and I don't know if you've seen that film, um, uh, uh, 12 Years a Slave, uh, yeah. and yeah. Uh, when uh, the Steve McQueen, who happens to be the director, went to the Oscars, uh, I, I often picture when there would be a film, you know, that would go in, uh, into the Oscars, which would be about you know, the Sikhs, you know, I, I still think about that. One day we'll get up on the podium and we'll tell everyone, um, or they'll know the story. I remember when uh, Steve McQueen went up on to collect his uh, Oscar and he was saying modern day slavery is still alive, sadly, today. And the figures that are revealed are unbelievable in terms of what's actually happening um, around the world, whether it be somebody who's entrapped in a slavery situation, you know, in terms of trafficking, or whether it's a situation like getting people to do uh, to farm for fish under very bad conditions themselves as slaves in order to boost a particular industry. In this particular case, it's a, it's a seafood industry that's based out of some company in Thailand. Um, and that's only because the West wants to have cheaper food. So we kind of like perpetuate that. You yeah, know what I think? of course. I think it's, all of this is uh, stuff that we've been talking about is so closely linked together because we're so comfortable in our modern lives here. We're so disconnected from the suffering of other people whether they're refugees or whether they're um, you know, enforced labor or human trafficking. Um, and I think we turn a blind eye because we, we're not personally prepared to give up any of our comforts uh, of our time, of our money, um, of our attention to look at these issues more seriously. And I think we always look internationally to world governments to um, create some kind of response. And their response is usually aggression, but there's very little follow through to actually address these human issues like displacement like uh, human trafficking and, and slavery. I mean, it's interesting that, um, you know, you meant, I mean, because of things like social media and stuff that people can use, I, I think it's powerful, but I think it has its limitations. If somebody turns a tap off, then you're not going to be able to um, get your water, are you? Therefore, you're not going to be able to communicate through those it's engines. It's powerful, but I, I'm worried about the way Sikhs are using it because it is becoming a social thing or even amongst groups, it's becoming a, a sort of negative thing or wasting time on gossip type of thing. But um, I think picking up on one of the points Shamsher raised, um, you see, individuals within democracy can do an awful lot. See, if we actually... To use those systems? To, yes. Like, to find I mean, we are consumers. We should identify what group, what company is buying cheap prawns mm. and basically start boycotting the product. Right. And um, companies, interestingly, do react quite fast to mm. consumer power. Um, and so that's something that we need to look at. Absolutely. Now, you know, we, were, we mentioned this last week, okay, and I, I wanted to just ask you quickly because uh, you happened to be around when this conference was going on. Uh, this was Ending Sexual Violence in Conflict Summit, uh, where Angelina Jolie and we had William Haig, and, it, you know, I think since then, I think Angelina Jolie has been made into a dame. Mm. Yeah, congratulations to her. Um, but it's interesting. If you, I was thinking about this from the 1984 situation in terms of the widows, you know, um, that, that's, um, that, it that was is a, a very the, pertinent um, conference. It, it was the largest global summit that's ever taken place on, on a specific subject, ending sexual violence within a conflict zone. Now, um, if you look at the Delhi massacre, um, specifically the, that time period, um, as well as the torture of Sikh women um, in the 10-year civil war by the Indian state, um, you see a lot of elements of sexual violence used. Mm. used uh, gang rape was used. And um, it was, it's a very difficult subject, but it, it's very good that so many countries came together. I mean, I think it was a lot of governments getting together. Then they had a fringe sort of um, conference I on the side. I think they had like a parallel streams running, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they, they try to be as inclusive as possible. Um, but basically, you're unfortu the unfortunate fact is that you actually have a lot of sexual violence going on around the world. And so in Bosnia, I was horrified to hear that 50 to 60,000 women had been raped within a three-year period. Um, so you have, a, a, it's being used, women are used as a weapon of war. Um, if the state wants to destroy um, even militants, um, let alone passive uh, peaceful uh, protesters, they, they, do, you, they do go for the sister, the wife, um, and... Unfortunately, women are used as a weapon of war. Yeah, I mean, um, very destructive, because it has a ripple effect, doesn't it? 
because you know if, if there's a rape situation and then the, there's a child and then you know mm. you know then that effectively generates a whole lot of other issues as well doesn't it it does and and in the um it was used against sikh uh, sikh women uh, over 10 years mm. a great deal um however um the current day situation like Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, I was quite horrified to realize there was a few women from the Congo who, um, who tried to work back there. But because uh, your laptop, your SIM card from your mobile phone, all of these minerals are coming out of the Congo. Yep. There's a lot of Western interest, even some banks apparently have got mining interests. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of Western interest to keep the warlords you know, in charge of various mines and therefore, that exploitation of women to carry on. And the Congo is, uh, according to quite a few documentaries, one of the most dangerous regions in the world and for women. And it's interesting you say that, because I was watching a really interesting documentary uh, ages ago called uh, Undiscovered, I think it's called uh, uh, Unreported World, I think it's called. It's a series of uh, documentaries yeah. that comes out, and, and they have really good journalists that go and try and get into exactly what's actually happening, things that are not reported, kind of an unreported world situation. And they went to, to Africa... Uh, cadmium is something that's used inside batteries. The Western kind of demand for cheap products means that you can get a free battery inside your little exciting toy that you buy, uh, sourced from China. So the Chinese interest in going into Africa, mining and uh, shipping it back to Africa, uh, from Africa to China, putting it into those kind of fast consumer goods and then shipping it over to the UK. And again, we find the same situation that over us uh, here in the West, where we're trying to buy this stuff we want it cheap, but then we don't realize the kind of supply chain that's actually in the background that's causing uh, negativity in terms of those individuals. You can argue the same with certain products uh, in terms of uh, clothes as well. You know? Although we, we won't mention any particular companies, but you know, you'd want to go down the road and you want to get a cheap, you know, some people might want to buy a cheap T-shirt or something, but ultimately there's a child that's stitching it together. I know in, in the World Cup uh, there was that a few years ago about Somebody in Pakistan was a little kid who was stitching the, the balls, but th some company was selling it really expensive, you know? Yeah. I think it would be really good if there was a sort of Sikh think tank that actually researched the ethics behind various companies. Mm. But they are getting away with a lot, and people don't realize it, because they're, they, if, unless it's going to hit the news headlines and the media is controlled by very few people, how is it going to reach the yeah, headlines that this How is, is it going to reach it? How does it stay in the light? And, and exploitation is, you know, continuing. Um, okay, so yeah, that, so we But just to, sorry, add sure. to the inter intersexual violence summit, you had over 110 countries attending formally um, in their gathering a ministerial capacity um, or foreign office capacity. But the unfortunate thing is, um, as far as I know, India was not representing itself. So it would have been good to see India, especially under a new regime of go government, being very committed to the fact that you cannot use people's families and their female members of their families as weapons of war. Basically. And the worst they thing is, if you look at the, 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 the rape cases that are coming out in uh, India today as well, yeah. you know, the fact that... It, it, it you know, should have been their number one priority. I think there priority. was a, a press article that I picked up on that somebody was, uh, you know, I think a, a girl had gone to report uh, a rape situation and... Um, you know, the, the police turned on her, you know, so the police need to take things seriously as well. Well, they're, they're, showing, the it in terms of a, they're showing it in terms of a mini system. You know, yeah. you have a special helpline for women regarding rape within India right mm. now. You have special ways of calling a number That's and good. calling a female police officer. But the fact is, why are you, uh, if this information was correct, why are you not present as a major democracy you know, you should be present at a, a, a global summit where Absolutely. every other country is Absolutely. trying to make itself known. Yeah, that, so we need to check whether they were yeah. there or not. I, I only got that yeah. from one article, so I wasn't okay. sure So they may have been there, we don't know. Um, let's move on to um, the next part of the program where we talk about uh, some Sikh news around the world. You know? Yeah. So Tell us all about it. You do all your research during the week, yeah. don't you? A little bit of a light-hearted one. There's been two uh, street renamings. Uh, one in Turlock, California. Street's been renamed to Singh Walkway. Um, and one in Brampton in Canada, where a street's been renamed to Gurdwara Gateway. Um, so that's quite good news for the North American members of the Sikh family. Um, they're catching up with us here in the UK. We've got quite a few streets. Isn't there one called renamed. Castle Way, I think? Yeah, there's quite a few that have been renamed. 
Um, and also in other news, um, the Sikh coalition has held its third briefing at the White House to discuss Sikh civil rights. Um, and they focused on issues um, such as discrimination, airport profiling, and bullying. And there's a good representation there by the government um, and their representatives from the Transport Security Administration. Okay. TSA. Um, yeah, TSA. And there's been quite a few issues with that recently in America. So it's good that they're engaging w um, with them on, on such a uh, state level. Um, and also, um, interestingly, out of the conference, the U.S. Department um, of Justice has agreed to translate all of its bulletins into Punjabi and all of its key advice um, for um, helping with uh, bullying um, into Punjabi to be uh, available to Punjabi families. So that's very interesting. Um, and moving over into uh, India, um, there's been protests in Nandir um, because the Shromni Akali Dal has wanted to create an all India uh, Gurdwara committee to manage all of the Gurdwaras in India. I think this is the second or third time they've tried to do this and they've always been met by stiff resistance. And Madan Mohan Singh, one of the um, board members of such Kansiri Huzur Sahib, um, he actually, I quote him, he says, those who cannot manage the affairs of Akal Takat are taking are uh, t talking of managing the Gurdwaras of the country. It would be better that Badal and the SGPC concentrate in improving the management of shrines under the latter's control rather than looking beyond its borders. So I don't know how uh, much steam that's going to gather. There's okay. been quite a stiff resistance, and we're going to see more of that developing in the coming weeks. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Uh, some news in Norway. Is that right? Um, some news in Norway. Arinda Singh Khalsa. Uh, oh, that's in uh, Sikh history. Uh, okay. You want to move on to that? We want to move on to that. Yeah, okay. we've only got a few minutes left. Okay, so uh, the, this uh, is uh, this the final part of the program where we talk about this week in history. So that was my little prompt there yeah. to so say, uh, let's move on to this bit of news. So this week in Sikh history, um, in 1606, the foundation of uh, Siddhi Akal Takat was laid by Guru Hargobind Sahib. Uh, and in 1670, uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur was arrested in Delhi. Um, and in 1919, five Gadri Babbe were hanged to death. Uh, people that don't know the Gadri Babbe were revolutionaries. Um, it's a movement founded in America, and their aim was to liberate India from the British. Um, and five of them were ha hanged this week. Um, and in 1984, a um, series of high-profile um, rejections of the government. Ram Jait Malani, an eminent lawyer, resigned um, his position in the Janta Party to protest against the events of 1984. Um, Sadhu Singh Hamdard returned his Padma Siri award. And Harinder Singh Khalsa, which I found really interesting, um, resigned his position at the Indian Embassy in Norway and sought asylum um, with his family. So it would be very interesting to research that further and find out what happened. Yeah, maybe we should do a kind of update and maybe for next week. Yeah. Have a look at that. Uh, okay, so we've come to the final part to do a quick summary of what we've been talking about. So um, apart from my uh, impromptu uh, kind of getting you onto the last bit, uh, <laughs> we were talking about uh, all the kind of things that happened in history and quite a lot. And we strongly encourage you to go online and actually do your research to find out more about the rich history of the Sikhs. Uh, and then we were talking about what's actually happening in India and what's happening around the world. In terms of our middle section of the show, we did talk about uh, the fact that you've got uh, this situation with a conference that took place last week, but more could be done there. Uh, we were talking about the uh, slavery situation, and we spoke about uh, Stephen Queen's comment about the fact that slavery is still sadly alive today and in the first part of the show we were talking about the sad increasingly worse situation over in Iraq and we were talking about um, really the increase in, in refugees uh, so I really appreciate your time this week just before we go I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about um, I'm so glad that you're here today so we can talk about your, your exciting projects you are doing work uh, with Dharan Punjab aren't you and that, that's really you know commendable um, and you've got writing projects. You know, we're so excited when you produce more work, you know, more books. So, oh, so there's an opportunity for you well, to last, issue this because an e-book, all these people with Kindles are dying to get hold of your book. Oh, thank you. The last 12 years we've been committed to the widows of Punjab. And um, quite honestly, there's a lot that are still destitute. They're elderly. And there's a lot of torture victims from the, who are now in their 40s and 50s. Uh, and the unfortunate thing is groups have not managed to coordinate or grow in capacity in the region. So there's a lot of families that still need but A lot help. of good work has been done by lots of groups, isn't there? There is, but um, I don't think we're ever in a position to pat ourselves on the back because this is our... What because we there's so owe much more to do. People. Yes, what we owe them is that every last survivor should be helped. And unfortunately, uh, families where a shaheed was famous got, got um, you know, sort of tuned in or families that had 
very good sort of PR mechanisms. But um, we are helping elderly people like Mata Jaswant Kaur. She lost six members of her family. Um, and elderly people, whether they're in this country or in India, are, are the last on most people's agenda. Um, and as I was saying to you about one family I came across, even from the Nirankari massacre, can you believe, in 1978, uh, they're so fragile that the daughter right now um, is being taken to court just trying to, on a personal custody battle regarding her child, and she uh, makes longer in the Harmandasa. We're very happy she's got a job, but these families are very fragile. Let's not assume enough has been done. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And Definitely, please issue your books on Kindle. So it's, uh, we've got the whole wide world on, on uh, e-books to get that. Tim Sher, thanks for joining us this week. Really appreciate your time and effort and energy to go into that. And we'll look forward to seeing you again. So until next time, why could you go Why could you go